Good morning and welcome to the worship service of Faith Fellowship Church here in Athens, Texas. Thanks for joining us today. In these weeks between Mother's Day and Father's Day, we're going to be looking at the home and looking at what God's will was for the home. What did God intend for the home to be? What did God's grace and goodness, uh, uh, did He want to get into our life through the home? Uh, Peter says that it, God has given us in salvation everything that pertains to life and godliness. Yet we look at the Word of God and so much of what God wants us to experience from Him, it comes into our life through our home relationships. So we invite you to take your Bible and open it with us this morning. We're going to be looking at the first of those things that God intended for us to have, and that's love. And um, we invite you to listen well. because I feel like today the difficulty with this message is most of us in a quick answer would say we're loving people. The problem is we want to use God's vocabulary, but we don't want to use God's dictionary. So today we're going to really be challenged to look at what that love is and what it looks like and uh, may have to come to the painful conclusion as I did this week that I'm not nearly as loving as I want to think I am. But hopefully today the Word of God will bless you and build you up and bless your home, bless your family, and God will use you in a wonderful way in your life. If you're ever in Athens, Texas on Sunday morning, we'd love for you to come worship with us in person. Our worship service begins at 10 o'clock. You'd be welcome and wanted. Thanks again for tuning in. Church, take your Bible with me and open to the book of Genesis, starting with Mother's Day a couple of weeks ago and going to end in Father's Day. We want to, in these weeks in between Mother's Day and Father's Day this year, look at the home. We don't do this every year, but I felt so um, compelled to this year. Of course, uh, two weeks ago we preached on Mother's Day and Mothers that make a difference. Last week was our Awana focus, but uh, I think the application to the home is obvious with Awana, raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, raising them to know, to know God and know His Word. But today I want us to, to talk about, um, in this series, I want to be looking at what God's will is for the home. In our last series about face to face of the fallen world, we, we started in Genesis and we looked at life as God intended. But uh, as we think about the home, I, I kept being drawn back to that first family and seeing it, what God intended to happen in the home. What, what did God want to give us from His heart to ours, but it was going to come to us through the vehicle of a home and of a home life. Uh, and we're going to look at four or five things in the next few weeks that God wants us to have in our life, and He wants it to begin in the home. Now again, we know that we don't live in a garden anymore. We live in... Uh, a world that's broken by sin and by the fall of man. And some of the things we're going to talk about, you're going to say, man, I, I would have given anything to God that at home. I didn't get that at home. And that's why God has given us His family. One of my great uh, favorite passages in Ephesians when it says that we have been no longer distance and a long way off, but God has brought us by the blood of His Son to be in the very household, the very family of God. Everything I didn't get from my human daddy I've been getting for years now from my Heavenly Father. Everything I didn't have in a home on 208 Herbert Street, Cherokee, Alabama, I've gotten in the family of God. And so whether it's, uh, you're going to hear things say, man, I, I was blessed. That's exactly what I got. None of us, I don't think, will be able to say we got it to the fullest because we had fallen parents. And as parents, we have fallen children. But today I want us to begin thinking about that, where it starts, and what should the home equal? Well, the first place, as you see the outline, we're going to talk about the home equals love. And it is this message that is foundational to the other things that God wants us to have. Without this, the other things like security, acceptance, understanding, those things, they're just not going to be there. It's almost impossible for that. So take your Bible with me and stand, if you would, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 26. We get down to verse 31. We're going to read it together off the monitor. Genesis chapter 1. Again, we're in the creation story and uh, we're seeing what happens. Look at verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, over everything that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed that shall be for food. 
and also every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on earth in which life is. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Now, the summary statement in verse 31, read it with me. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and morning were the sixth day. Pray with me, would you, one more time? Father, I need you this morning to preach. I sense the veil is thick and the deception is strong. So God, I pray your Holy Spirit would be mighty through your word to our lives. Help us see through the delusion and the deceit of the enemy to where we really are and what we're actually doing that you might transform our lives, that you might transform our home, and in that you transform our family. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would. As a young preacher years ago, I, as I attended seminaries and Bible colleges, I would hear people say, conservative theologians say, and then they would quote a liberal or make a liberal statement. And I would hear that oftentimes, a conservative theologian say, and they would make a liberal quote. And so one day, I'm talking to Dean Timothy George, and I said, Dean George, I said, Dean, help me understand this. And he said, Tony, here's the issue. They use our dictionary, I mean, I'm sorry, they use our vocabulary, but they don't use our dictionary. That helped me a little bit, but I, I began to understand, uh, in Europe, at the, after the end of World Wars, uh, the philo philosophical uh, opinion of the day was that God is dead. There is no God. They saw man's inhumanity to man, and they laid it at God's feet. If there was a God, God wouldn't have let that happen. And the fact that sin brought that on was never there. So Satan interpreted the pain of the world wars in Europe. A whole con and said, God is dead. There is no God. So if you lived in Europe and you believed in the existence of a God, you were a flaming evangelist. Now, you could believe all kinds of crazy stuff. You didn't have to believe that Jesus was divine. You didn't have to believe the Bible was in there and Word of God. You didn't have to believe the salvation was by faith alone. If you just believed there was a divine being called God, you were lab labeled a conservative. Guys like Bart, Bultmann, Schleiermacher, those guys who are flaming liberals are quoted today in many conservative Christian th uh, theology books because they were called conservatives over there. And because they were called conservative there, people who followed their teaching considered themselves conservative. Now, here's the issue with that. Some were absolutely innocent in doing it. They, they, that's all they knew. I found out from going to both liberal and conservative seminaries that in conservative seminaries, I had to read as much liberal writing as I did conservative. But then we saw from Scripture why that wasn't acceptable and that wasn't true. But when I went to liberal seminaries, I was never made to read the conservative people. Why? Because when truth and error lay down side by side, truth always wins out. And if you're going to keep people deceived and keep them confused, you can't tell them truth. You've got to hide it from them. So those guys would stand in the, the classroom behind a lecture and say, conservative theologians say, and then they'd quote Bart, Bultmann, Slymarker, one of those guys. Because to them, that was conservative theology. But they used our vocabulary, and they didn't use our dictionary. Now, back to the two issues. Some of them didn't realize they were doing it. That's just all. They'd been, they, they thought that they'd never studied conservative guys. They, everybody said they were conservatives. They just accept they were conservative. But there were other guys who knew better. And it was a method of deceit. Band, and uh, years ago, near one of my pastorates, uh, a search committee chairman called me and said, uh, I need to talk to you about uh, this. I've got a question, a theological question that I want to ask you. And I said, well, oh, okay. And uh, he did. And he said to me, this gentleman that we're considering for pastor swore to us that he is a conservative theologian. I knew the guy. He didn't believe in the deity of Christ. But neither did Barton Slimarker, Boltmann. Neither of those guys. So I said to him, go back and ask him this one question. Are you a conservative by American standards? You're a conservative by Europe standards. And do you understand there's a difference? 
And when he asked him the question, he just kind of dropped his head and smiled and said, well, I prefer their definition. He knew what he was doing. Now, why am I saying all this? Because that's the one illustration I could think of to try to get us over the deceit that we're living in. They said, Pastor, you don't, you're already calling me to see You don't even know me. I know I am. And I apologize for that. But I think for it's over, you'll agree I'm right. This is a, an area where deception, using a vernacular with a different dictionary, is absolutely universal because it's a part of the fall. I think for most of us, it is absolutely unintentional. It's unintentional. But regardless of the motive, it's still wrong. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about that one word. Home equals love. Oh, you can't tell me I'm loving. I'm not saying you're not loving. I'm saying you may have the wrong dictionary. This week I got confronted with stuff in 41 years of pastoring. I never, dots I'd never put together. And I've told you before, I I don't mind telling you again, I've never stood behind the pulpit and preached a sermon that I was 100% uh, example of. I've never, never made that claim. But I do need to tell you, I had my invitation to the sermon last Thursday. When God said to me, how are you going to preach that when you haven't been living that? And I knew I couldn't preach this until I talked to my wife. I started off by telling her, that jerk you married has got some stuff he's got to tell you. Because I realized, and I, I don't think in most things, I'm, I'm fairly mainstream when it comes to being a guy. It's so easy. It is so subtle. And it is so universal that we love in the way we are comfortable loving. And if it's beyond that, we don't do it. We just say we're loving. We claim to be loving and we let it go. And we will not be deterred from that idea. You can't tell me I'm not loving. No, but I believe before it's over, we're going to be able to look and say, would God say you're loving? It's a hard message. I don't think it's hard because you don't want to hear the Word of God. I'm I'm blessed. I stand every Sunday and I preach to a a vast majority, a large majority, not 100%, but a large majority of our people want to know, what does the Word of God say? Teach me clearly, directly. Don't don't make it hard. Tell me what the Word of God says. And that's my job, to preach the Word of God. So I'm not saying this because I think you're not going to want to get it. Listen to me. It's going to be hard because you may think you've already got it. And I'm not sure we do. I'm just asking you at the beginning, I'm taking a long time to introduce this, to ask you this one thing. Will you just please at least be open to the thought that you might not be loving at all? Not nearly loving the way God says we're to love. It's been said, the supreme happiness of life is the conviction that I am loved. I love those words. Supreme happiness of life is the conviction, not a hope so, think so, maybe so, but the conviction, I am loved. Every one of us are born into life where, number one, we are, as we examine love, we're going to realize that that's something that we are expecting If you want to fill in the outline, we're going to examine love and the way God talks about it here in the first family. There is knowledge that's called a priori, something that's called post priori. And what that simply means is some things you understand before studying it. You have an idea that that's right before you ever get there. Some stuff you've got to study on it. You've got to read. You've got to learn. And then you come to a knowledge about it. But the fact that you should be loved and the fact that you were created to be loved, everybody comes into the planet believing that, and that's an a priori thing. I know it's right to be loved. We know that. 
But as we examine love, I want us to think about, number one, that we are created in love. As we look at Adam, we see that God said, let us make man in our own image. That same God who's defined in scriptures, God is love. So let's make man in our image. We are a loving God. He's going to be a loving, loved creation from our hands. God created man to be loving. Number two, not only were we created in love, we were created to love. You know the creation story, God created Adam sometime before Eve. Adam named all the animals. Adam had a, time, had a chance to look at everything in creation and come to the conclusion, there is nothing on the planet that is comparable to me for a mate. Nothing. And I believe that's exactly what God wanted Adam to come to so that Adam would understand Eve and what she was when she got there. There's not anything on the planet like this. And so God says to Adam, it's not good that man should be alone. So he creates Adam. And, and, and we saw it. Look over in chapter 2. We, we read chapter 1. Look at chapter 2, verse 18 real quick. And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. That word is so rich and deep and full. It's pregnant with meaning that we very seldom ever plumb. But that man needs a woman that's comparable to him. Her highs are his lows. His lows are her highs and vice versa. That there are, God has for us a, a comparable relationship that makes the both full and whole. Look at verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. That somebody said proves that Adam wasn't a southerner. We don't give up a rib for nobody. <laughs> Verse 22, the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to her. Listen to what Adam said. This is now bone of my bones. Flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In 41 years, I never connected that verse to Ephesians chapter 5. In the letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes in the fifth chapter about the home and the husband-wife relationship. And he's going to say something here that may be kind of, it sounds odd to the ear, but not when you begin to add some other places where it's, where it's mentioned as well. If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 28. It says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Now, think about it. Paul is reaching all the way back to creation and he said, whoa, woman, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She's not just some living appendage over here like a walking foot or a walking arm. She is a part of me though and she is bone of bone and flesh of my flesh. She's out of me and she's for me, from me and for me. And Paul reaches back and he says, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? One never hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, we're not talking about some kind of narcissistic, prideful self-love. Somebody has said this statement is kind of another way of saying the golden rule. Do unto others, have them do unto you. Treat your wife as good as you treat yourself. Now, you see, part of the problem comes in here because I'm talking to somebody who's saying, man, my daddy told me I was worthless. My mama uh, turned me loose and didn't love me. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even like myself. Well, that's another problem. That's another problem. Satan has interpreted your pain, and you're having a hard time. Before it's over this morning, I pray you'll love yourself. You'll love yourself. Because God created you to be loved. But until you're loved, you can't be loving. It's really hard to give away what you don't have. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Paul reaches back and he says, when I love my wife, a, a great way to measure that is I'm, am I as good to her as I am myself? Think about that for just a minute. Don't rush by it too fast. When I'm hungry, I eat. When I want something, I want it. When I'm going to do something, I go do it. But how about her needs? What about her wants? 
What about her fulfillment in the going and doing? Do I, do I, am I as concerned for it as I am for myself? You see, I, I really struggled with this until I connected this dot. When Jesus was before the lawyers and they asked him the greatest commandment, he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he added the second is like unto the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I think the golden rule is a, good, is a good picture of that. Treat others, have them treat you. But I think when it comes to our husband and wives in the home, it's much deeper than the simplicity of a golden rule because I can be nice to my neighbors without really being loving. But how can I be to my wife less than what I am to myself and still be deceived to think that I love her? I love her. Now, I get it. I've got all kinds of words. The Greeks had four words for love. Eros, sexual love. Storge, the family love. Phileo, the brotherly love. But agape was the godlike love. One of the first three aren't even mentioned in the Bible at all. But the word that's used most often, even in the Old Testament, the word is kesed. Kesed. If you know somebody named kesed, they're named out of the Hebrew word love. That's the word that's used over and again in the Bible. Jesus said, love others as I have loved you. That comparison in there always bothers me. No, you can't just love them the way you want to. Love them as I loved you. And husbands, love your wife as you love yourself. Any fog lifting? Any deceptions coming clear? Oh, I... I treat her kind. I hadn't left her. She's still here. I, I work. I provide. I, I do. I'm this. I'm that. I'm the other. And we want to define that as love because that's the lie. That's the deception that Satan has wanted us to accept. But that's what it is. He's a liar and the father of all lies and he's deceiving us. And to do so ignorantly, I believe before God is one level of sin, but to know what you're doing and to keep doing it is an unacceptable Christian thought now I want to move to not Roman number two experiencing love I want to uh, reach back and lean on Dr. Campbell and Dr. Uh, um, Chapman years ago this guy named Campbell came up with the idea that he's a Christian he's a Christian uh, psychologist and counselor and he said you know every, all of us have a love tank God created us to be loved. We just said that. We were created for love. So all of us have a, 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 a reservoir of love that we can, a place that we can store and maintain that we are loved. And he says that's great as long as that tank is okay and full. But when that tank gets low, like the warning light that comes on on your vehicle that you're about to run out and die right where you're at, so our own love tank gets empty and we begin to have issues that ought to be for us warning lights saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so out of that idea, Dr. Chapman wrote a book called The Five Languages of Love. And we're going to see Dr. Chapman didn't invent it. It was God did. God, that's exactly what God shows us. But he pulls it together in a way that helped me as a young husband in some powerful ways. I, I'm not going to stay long on it, but I want to look at the five ways that we experience love. This is the way, one of these ways you experience. Now, a second one may be pretty good. But listen to me. There's that one love, way you experience it, that if you don't get it, your tank will inevitably stay empty. And you'll have to try to face life. How will I live life unloved? I got to the place where I was just a little ways away from accepting the fact that this is what marriage is. It's a loveless relationship but I'm a Christian I will not walk out I will not leave but this must be what it's going to be and God used the truth I found here he led to me to save my own understanding of what marriage is supposed to be here's the way we experience love one way is through affirming words now what did God say to Adam when he created he said everything else it was good he creates Adam and he looks at Adam and he says oh boy very good very good Affirming words. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have the God who created you, the God of creation, the God of gods, have a relationship with you and what that must have been like? The second way we experience love is through quality time. Now, quality time doesn't mean just time. It also means a quality experience or a quality event. 
What does the Bible say? In the cool of the day, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve. Now, can you imagine God saying, hey, I'm God of the universe, but I got, I, I got something I want to do. I want to spend time with you. I want you to have that thought the next time you think about skipping your devotional time in the morning or in the night whenever you have it. Whenever you're tempted and I read your Bible and pray, I want you to remember that thought. God longs to spend time with you more than you long to spend it with Him. God longed for that time, a quality time. One of the third way is gifts. It doesn't have to be expensive gifts. It could be little gifts. But <laughs> think about it. <laughs> it's, it's blew me away. How many times? I've probably said it to my wife. I don't know I ever said it to any of the kids, but I probably said it to Nancy, and she knew it was her. Maybe I love you so much. I'd give you the world. <laughs> but can you, can you get your mind around that? God gave Adam and Eve the world. It's yours. It's yours. You're to have dominion over it. I've given you the world. I've given you a life. I've given you a relationship with me. I've given you everything I've created. I've put it in your hands for you to be dominion. He gave them the world. Good gift. Fourth thing, acts of service. This happens to be my bride's love language. Acts of service. God looked at Adam and he said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'm going to do something and in an act of service, God creates Eve, a woman comparable to him, and he gives her to him. He served Adam where Adam had a need. And the fifth thing is physical touch. Now, I'm not going there. I understand God is spirit. I'm not saying that they had physical touch. But I know this. There's times when I hold my wife and she holds me, and I sense the love of God. How much more must it have been when Adam and Eve held each other, they knew God did this. God brought this about. Now, those are five languages of love. Those are the way we experience love. Now, if you happen to have the same what's called love language as your spouse, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. But if the statistics are right, 80% of us don't. I didn't. I, I, I thought, for time's sake, I'm not going to do it, but I, I, I took my phone out, I sat in my office, and I've got a little translator, and I put in the word, I love you. And I, and I listened to the audio, and I wanted to play it into my microphone and let you all hear one to see when you fear. I was saying to my wife, I love you. I was speaking Cambodian, and she speaks South Texas. I was saying I love you, but I was telling her in the way I experience love. Because that, but now think about those in the home. Every, look at that list. Affirming words. Oh, honey, you're, you're doing great. Honey, you're so good. Oh, I, I know you got thrown out at first, but that was the best run I've ever seen anybody make. Oh, just a quality time. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's, let's watch this. Come on, let, let, let's, go, let's go camp. Let, let's spend time together. Gifts. Oh, it's your birthday. Here it's Christmas. Here they are. All these gifts. Acts of service. We serve our children. We do it all the time. Physical touch. I hope you hug them and love them. And so we, we, we're at home. We have a chance between a mom and a daddy both. We may not get all five from one. We got a really good chance of getting all of that at home and having a really full, pretty full love time. Think about when we start dating. <laughs> oh, I, lo I love you. You're so pretty. Oh, I love you. Man. <laughs> Quality time. No, I'm not going to hang up. You hang up. I love you. I'm not, no, you, you hang up first. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'll call you back. I love you. We just spend time together. Gifts. I bought you a Snickers bar because I thought of you. We give gifts. Uh, acts of service. Let me open that door, honey. Don't you, open, don't you touch that door. I got it. I get it. Let me, let, me, let me carry your books. I got that. Hang on, honey. I got it. And we do all that. Physical touch. Oh, baby. Oh, man. I'm a kisser. Physical touch. Hold my hand while we walk down the mall together. Kiss me goodnight. I'm leaving. We do all that stuff. Then we get married. <laughs> it ain't that we quit loving. We just quit saying in all those ways it didn't mean nothing to us. I can't tell you how many people have sat across my desk and said, he don't love me anymore, she don't love me anymore. And I hear him say, how can you say that? I get up every day, I work like a dog, I work 10, 12-hour shifts, I come out and do everything I can. And I'm sort of thinking, okay, 
acts of service. That's his love language. Hers is quality time. You're working all these hours thinking to show you love her. And she's sitting home saying, I wish he loved me enough to come home. I didn't know which one my love language my wife was. So the suggestion was start, try one and start it. And when you get it, you'll know it. I started out with affirming words. I started leaving little notes all over the house. Love you, baby. You're doing a great job. One day I got home from the office. I walked in. She had a handful of papers. She said, why are you leaving this trash all over the house? <laughs> yeah. That ain't it. Mark that one off. She didn't want to sit around and hold hands. She didn't want to do all that stuff. She'd care less. It's time to try acts of service. Her and the kids were gone. I had the day to the house. I cleaned that sucker from top to bottom. I vacuumed. I washed the laundry. I put on beans and cornbread and fried taters. And I made a meatloaf. You're hungry, aren't you? I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> she come home with the kids. I just sat in my chair. She walked through the house. She walked through the kitchen. I won't say any more than this. I was king for the weekend. <laughs> I could do no wrong. I found my woman's love language. But see, it's not mine. Which means I have to consciously think about telling her I love her. Because here we were, married seven years. But we'd been saying I love you. She'd been doing acts of service, which didn't mean it ripped to me. I didn't care about that. I didn't say I love you to me. She wasn't holding my hand. It was like, didn't mean a thing. I wasn't doing acts of service for her. Wasn't even thinking about it. Because I was doing it my way. So I'm hoping I'm helping somebody right now. When you realize we experience love differently. If you've got more than one child, they do too, by the way. But the good thing about a home, as I said, in the context of a home and even in the dating relationship, we get that and we get pretty good. But then we get married and we settle into saying love, expressing love in the way that it means it to us. And some of you have been married a long time and you just accepted years ago that a loveless marriage is what it is and this is what it is. So I'm just going to hang on and grit it out. And you're that close to getting your love tank filled back up and being refreshed and renewed completely on what God intended for you to have through marriage, and that was a love filled to the full with Him. Well, quickly, we've got to move on. Number four, or number three, expressing love. Now listen, love always, I've got it in capital letters in my outline, it's bold, italic, and it's underlined. Always, love always expresses itself. Now what you're doing don't, because it ain't really love. And that's one way you'll know that you've been duped and deceived and you've been walking in what you call love, but God's proven to you it's not. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Love always finds a way to express itself. Now you need to know the five ways to express it, to find the way that when you express it, it means something to the one you're wanting to express. You, can you imagine the heart? I'm going to go back. Can you imagine the heartbreak it was to me when the woman I love with all of my heart and all of my life, I had to realize she's gone now for years not knowing that I loved her. Because I was saying, I love you in Cambodian, and she don't speak it. It wasn't her language. To get to say to her, I love you, and to get to say it to her in a way she hears it, in a way that it means something, and in a way that matters the most. Now, there'll be a second one that may be good, but listen, it ain't nothing like the one. The one. But love always finds a way to express itself. And if you love her, and if you love him, you'll care enough to know which love language do they have. Guys, one of the ways, if we were having marital counseling, and I know we're not, but because she, she's here, but uh, if we're having marital I'd say to you, if you don't know her love language, listen to what she gripes about the most. You don't ever spend time with me. You don't, ever, you don't ever say anything kind about it. You don't ever say anything good. You don't even bring me a Snickers bar, you tightwad sucker. You don't ever do nothing. I do everything right now. You don't ever do nothing for me. Baby, just hold my hand. Come cuddle with me. When I sit down on the couch and stand up to me, you tell me you're hot and you get up and move and turn the fan on. It ain't about temperature. Listen to what they complain about the most and you'll identify pretty quickly 
what they're longing for, what they're trying to say. They're not just trying to gripe and complain. They're trying to say to you, I don't feel loved. That's no small thing. That's a big deal. I don't feel loved. They gripe all the time. I can't ever please her. I, I do this. And while you, you start saying how you express love and how you feel so justified and how loved she should feel and how, how she should know she's loved. And it didn't cross your mind. She didn't get to hear a word of it. You didn't say it her way. God says, I love you in the ways that we hear it. And he knows us. He created us. And he says, I love you in the ways that we need to know it. Love always finds a way to express itself. My love for my wife expressed itself when I got on my knee down in San Marcos, Texas and slipped a ring on her finger and asked her to be my wife. Love always finds a way to express itself. Think about that for just a little bit. We're going to move on. I don't want you to keep thinking about it while we move on. But what expressions of love could anybody that you're supposed to be loving find in your recent history? You loved yourself. I guarantee you that. Did you love her like that? Godly love expresses itself in four ways. And it says this. Number one, godly love, when it's expressed, says you have value. You have value. That means that you, you are, you're worth and you're desirable. You, you, you mean something to me. You have value to me. I, I, I look at you and I don't see a debit. I look at you and I see a credit. I don't see somebody that takes. I see somebody that gives, adds, multiplies who I am and what I am. Secondly, godly love says you have validity. You're right to be here. You have a, you're, you're accepted in my life. You're accepted in my world. I don't just love you. I like you. If we're choosing teams, I'm picking you first. I want you. I want you. Because... You have validity. Number three, you're venerable. You're worthy of love and you're worthy of respect. Love leads to, you can't appreciate something you don't love. You can't appreciate a woman you're not loving if you're loving uh, in, in some less way. You don't, that's one way to find out if you're loving her God's way. Uh, what kind of appreciation do you have for your husband? What kind of appreciation do you have? For you? But if you just knew all the stupid stuff they did, I know they married you. We know it. We figured it out already. That was ugly, wasn't it? It just popped out. It just popped out. It just popped out. I was looking at Chuck, and it just seemed right. <laughs> it got worse, didn't it? <laughs> it has nothing to do with reciprocating. It has to do with unconditional love. That's the love of God. Think about it. God commended his love to us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died. On the worst day of my existence, on the day I was the sorriest, on the day that I was the most sinful, on the day that the wickedness of my life was at full boil, God looked at it and said, I love that guy. My son died for that guy. We're going to get to it a little bit more in a second. I, I, I saw a quote, I, I, a story I really liked on this, that you're worthy of respect and appreciated. Uh, a couple named Bill and Judy were having their 50th wedding anniversary. And everybody, they, they, they were marveled. You know, we, we, we know people like this. They, they were like, it was a marvel to, to watch them. They just, they just had this wonderful, wonderful relationship. And so at the 50th anniversary celebration, somebody said to Bill, Bill, how did you have a marriage in such a way that your wife was so loved and so full and so vibrant? How, how did you do that? And he said, and I've never told anybody this or shown it to him. He pulled out of his pocket an old pocket watch. On my wedding day, my father-in-law gave me this pocket watch, a gold pocket watch, and he opened it. And on the inside, there was a scription, an inscription, and it says, Say something nice to Judy today. Love always finds a way to express itself. That every day when I looked at my watch, that on the inside, he said, I knew it was time to go say something nice to Judy. He said, every day, not all day every day, but every day I've tried to find a time. Why? Because love looks for a way to express itself. Love just looking for half a reason to say I love you. Love just looking for a, an, 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 an open gap at all to get in there and say, hey, I love you. 
Number four, love always says you're vital. What does that mean? The word vital means essential. You're vital to me. You're essential. God said, I'm going to make you a woman that's comparable to you. Comparable to you. She's not just, like I said, she's just not a, a walking appendage, a living appendage. She is essential to my life being what God wanted my life to be when he created me. I said, listen, there, there is an essential need you've got that I'm going to meet through this one called woman. And I'm going to give her to you, and I'm going to give you to her. And that's why Adam says we become one flesh. That's why Jesus talked about that when we accept him, we are the body of Christ. That love of being oneness, of being of each other, from each other, in each other, for each other. Essential. If you're going to experience the fullest and greatest experience that you will ever know on this side of heaven, God tucked it away in the family relationship between a man and a woman. He said, now here, walk in it every day. Enjoy it every day. But now we know the rest of Adam and Eve's story, don't we? They sinned. What happened? They were shamed. They started blaming each other. They started throwing each other under the bus. Thinking about themselves. And all the while, God said, listen, I didn't create you for that. I didn't create you in that. That's a part of the fall. That's why in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, everything we need for life and godliness is there. Because I'm going to tell you, now I'm not saying that people who aren't Christians don't love each other. They do, but they're not using God's dictionary. Maybe they had a great example. And they're trying to follow that example and they're trying to do things. But it's always going to break down at some point because you can't give away what you don't have. And God put his love in you for you to give it away first and foremost at the house with that person you call spouse. Now I want to give us these applications and we've got to be done. When we accept God's love in Christ and salvation, transformation gives us these assurances. Here today I want you to leave with these four things settled in your heart. Because everything we're going to talk about in the next few weeks are dependent upon us getting this right this morning. The first application is this. I am loved by God. Now listen, I might be talking to somebody, you, you've had hard things and Satan interpreted your pain. And one of the lies Satan tried to get you to believe is that God didn't really love you. That God, No, no, God loves other people, but God don't love you. Look at the bad stuff you went through. Look at the heartache you had. Look at how somebody mistreated you. And you Satan interpreted your pain and he's got you to lay that at God's feet instead of sins. And he's stolen from you the truth. God loves you. And he sent his son to die for you, that you through him might be saved, forgiven of your sins, and brought into the holy family of God to live in and walk in the fullness of everything God created you in and for when it comes to love. Your love. Number two, I can love myself in a godly way. Again, I'm not talking about narcissism or pride or arrogance. I'm not talking about that nonsense. But I'm talking about in the way that God expects me to love myself. Nobody had to convince me to do that. I don't go around hitting my finger with hammers. I don't go around depriving my... I, I just, we don't We treat ourselves well. Now again, I understand there's some out there that part of the lie, steal, and kill of the enemy to you has been that uh, you don't even love yourself. Hear me this morning. God loves you, and you can love yourself. You can love yourself. Number three, I can allow others to love me. I can allow others to love me. You know that person that beats up on everybody, mistreats everybody? You know the bad thing about it? That's how they treat themselves. Hurting people hurt people. But once I know God loves me, once I... I allow to love myself. I can let others love me now. And then fourthly, I can love others. I can love others. Not with this watered down, fleshly, uh, the depra depravity ridden, defined thing I'm calling love. But I can love others in the same way I love myself. Because I can love myself. And all of this should be learned first and most convincingly in a home. I know. I know. I, did, I didn't have it. If I got anything that felt like love, I had to earn it. 
had to earn it. I know. But I'm telling you, one day I found Jesus as my Savior. He found me. And I realized that my Heavenly Father has not one of the frailties and failures of my earthly daddy. God the Father is not my daddy. My daddy was my daddy. Now I'm going to tell you, my daddy loved me in the only way he could. I could take time to explain that to you. I don't have time to do it. But I have no doubt in my mind, my daddy went to bed every night thinking, I love my family. He loved them like Bart and Bultman and Schleimacher were conservatives. He used our vocabulary, but he didn't use God's dictionary. To love others. So maybe your child at home, that's one thing, but let's talk about your adult house. How's your adult home doing? Are you bringing the broken baggage of your childhood home into your grown-up home? Are you allowing the redemption in Christ Jesus to transform you and to fill up the cracks and the brokenness and the hurt and make you whole and well in the love of God that allows you to love yourself and to love others in the way you love yourself? I referred to it earlier. Ephesians chapter 2, 13 says, But now... In Christ Jesus, you were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of the family of God. It all starts at the cross for us. If you're still mad at a mom and dad for not giving you what they didn't have, well, listen, that's just silly. How could they give you what they didn't have? they didn't have the love of Jesus in their life, they didn't know Christ, they, didn't, they weren't walking in, in the Spirit of God, how could they give you what God intended you to have? They didn't even have God in their life. Same warning to you who don't know Christ and you're wanting to love others and you're wanting your children or your spouse or your other body. To, you can't give away what you don't have. And you're using their vocabulary. But they know you're not using their dictionary because they don't feel loved at all. They may know you're trying. You may get some credit for trying. But that doesn't make their love tank feel any more full. It's not. Today, will you let the love of Christ draw you to Him? The one who loves you like nobody has ever or could ever love you. On the worst, most sinful day you've ever had, God loved you. Not because of anything. He just loved you. Unconditional love sacrificial love. I love you. I'll, my son will die on the cross to pay for your sin, to make you now acceptable to a holy God who wants to love you with a holy love and place in you a holy love that you can give away a holy love. That's the cycle. But it starts with him and us receiving the redemptive love of Calvary. Paul put it this way, I beg you, in Christ's stead. If, if Jesus were standing right here in my boots, I'm begging you, please accept Jesus. His love not only transforms you, it transforms everybody God lets you touch because you can touch Him with a love. My greatest fear is you not even be open to the reality that you're not loving. I hope we got past that. hope we got through that. And you honestly say this morning, my spouse is married to a jerk. <laughs> I don't love him like I love myself. Not even close. Not even close. But that's going to stop today. God enables me because he's given me his love. His love has been shed abroad in my heart. Therefore, I can love others. Because I'm loved, I love myself. I can let others love me, and I can love others. You may have to work out the language. Do it. It'd be worth every effort, I promise you. Home should equal love. Love. It is the supreme and fundamental 
the expression of happiness is the conviction I am loved. Especially by those who know me best and love me anyway. Wow. That's good stuff. Can we pray about it this morning? Would you bow your head with me? Maybe the issue is very simple. You've never accepted Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. The love of God is still outside of you. You've never received it. You've never been willing to humble yourself and say, my sin separates me from my holy God. Through the blood of His Son, through the great expression of His love, God loved me and sent His Son to die for me. I want to receive that love and respond to that love, and I want to receive Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. That's where it's got to start. If you've never done that this morning, I beg you, do that this morning. If the Spirit of God is drawing you, if the Spirit of God is showing you, that's what you need. That's His loving call and His loving draw to say, come to me this very morning and you'll leave here loved by a holy God of heaven who made a way for you to be acceptable in the sight through the blood of His Son and His expression of love. Maybe say, Pastor, I, I've been a Christian a long time. Are you loving others the way you love yourself? Are you loving others in the standard, in the dictionary definition of love that God has given us? <coughs> I had to ask God to forgive me. And Thursday, I had to get before my wife and say, Baby, I am so sorry. I see what I've done. I know what I've been doing. Not all the time, but way too often. I love you the way I want to, not the way I ought to. And she kissed me and said, I don't even know what you're talking about. I forgive you. Maybe today somebody you need to go to and say, forgive me. Forgive me. I've not loved you. I've called it love, but I was lying. I was deceived. It's not true. But I want it to be true today. Father God, as we give this time to you, we pray your Holy Spirit would draw us and we'd simply know the love for us that calls us and draws us to yourself and it would let you have your way. We'd say yes to the grace and goodness and the love you're showing. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me?